Uh, what is the background of this trial? Stitch trial, surgical treatment of ischemic heart failure. Uh, the background is that coronary artery disease is the commonest substrate for heart failure. And the role of CABG for treatment of coronary artery disease with heart failure has not been clearly established. The trials in the 70s, which compared CABG with medical therapy alone, were predominantly in patients with chronic stable angina. And these trials excluded patients with severe LV dysfunction. And a meta-analysis of this trial showed that only 7% of the patients who underwent randomization had an EF of less than 40%. And only 4% had primary symptoms of heart failure rather than angina. And all these trials predate the major developments in medical therapy and cardiac surgery of the present time. So this stitch chart trial had two hypotheses. Hypothesis one was surgical revascularization hypothesis. And hypothesis two was LV restoration hypothesis, which we will not talk about, which was a negative trial. And uh, the LV restoration did not uh, prove to be useful in patients which were selected. So hypothesis one said that in patients with heart failure, LV dysfunction and CAD amenable to surgical revascularization, CABG added to intensive medical therapy will decrease all cause mortality compared to medical therapy alone. And there was a subset of this trial, a secondary hypothesis, which said that presence and extent of dysfunctional but viable myocardium as defined by radionuclide imaging or dobutamine stress testing, or both, will identify patients with the greatest survival advantage of medicine plus CABG compared to medicines alone. And of course, LV restoration hypothesis, which we will not talk about. So we are talking about this study, which was published in the New England Journal. And it randomized 1,212 patients with heart failure, LV dysfunction, and coronary artery disease, which, who were amenable to CABG and 602 received medicines alone, and 610 randomized to CABG with medicines. And what was found at the end of, end of five years, all-cause mortality was not very much different. There was a hazard reduction of 14%, which was not statistically significant. So the primary endpoint was that as randomized, CABG led only to a 14% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality compared to medical treatment alone and this was not significant. So the question is, has CABG no role in ischemic heart failure? The primary operator, uh, investigator, Dr. Eric Velasquez, said we were unable to show a significant benefit for CABG in our primary analysis, but if you dive deeper, the data are much more supportive of bypass surgery. For example, the cardiovascular mortality had a significant 19% relative risk reduction which when adjusted for other baseline differences was almost 23% with uh, uh, significant p-value. So cardiovascular mortality was reduced. The endpoint of death or cardiovascular hospitalization also was reduced by about 36% or 30%. Then the most important is the time varying hazard ratios. Uh, the, uh, in, the, in the first month or within 30 days, the medical group behaved better because of surgical mortality, which was high. But as you go beyond two years, it is a surgical group which uh, showed a significant benefit in terms of mortality. Then again, what, what about the patients who crossed over? And if you analyze the actual treatment, the previous analysis which I showed was intention to treat analysis. But if you analyze the actual treatment received, let us see. Out of the 602 patients randomized for medicine only, there were 65 who crossed over to CABG due to acute decompensation. And out of the 610 who were randomized to CABG, the 55 did not receive CABG. So if you analyze people who have actually taken the treatment of CABG or medicine, there was a 30% risk reduction, which was very, very significant. Also, as per protocol, those who stuck to their protocol uh, after, after the switchovers, the risk reduction was 24%, which was also significant. So the conclusions were that stitch trials supports bypass surgery on top of best medical therapy versus medical therapy alone 
to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Although the totality of information supports CABG, there is an early hazard. A fair approach is to evaluate each patient's prognosis. If they have low likelihood of living two years or don't want to take the risk of having surgery, medical therapy may be a good option. Also, as a start, aggressive medical therapy should be initiated and optimized according to evidence-based guidelines. For patients with persistent or progressive symptoms, revascularization can be offered. Patients who are being treated for heart failure should be evaluated for coronary disease and heart failure without angina should not exclude patients from an angiographic evaluation. Then there is a sub-study which I would uh, go to, thus viability hypothesis. This was a prospective sub-study which tested the hypothesis that assessment of myocardial viability and identifies patients with coronary artery disease and LV dysfunction who have the greatest survival benefit with CABG compared to aggressive medical therapy. And the protocols used were spectthalium and dobutamine and the, the selection of patients was optional for the investigators and out of 1212 patients only 601 patient, less than 50% of patients were having uh, viability results, studies which had valid results, interpretable results. And out of these 601 patients, uh, 487 patients had viable myocardium and 114 patients had non-viable myocardium. And the results, what do they suggest? The results show that association between myocardial viability and survival by itself is non-significant when subjected to a multivariable analysis that includes other baseline variables and the results fail to demonstrate a significant interaction between myocardial viability and medical versus surgical treatment with respect to mortality, whether assessed according to treatment assigned or treatment actually received. So implications were that in patients with CAD and LV dysfunction, assessment of myocardial viability does not identify patients who will have the greatest survival benefit from CABG. However, one should note the limitations of trial. Patients were selected for viability testing individually at the phys physician's discretion. And the patients represented a subpopulation of stage trial. The number of patients without vi viability was quite small, 114 only, which limited statistical power. Analysis was limited to SPECT and dobutamine echo alone, not PET or cardiac MRI were not done. And use of two different imaging methods for assessing myocardial viability and their limitations as far as sensitivity and specificity are concerned should be noted. Hence, despite all the imperfections in this study, it suggests that assessment of viability alone may not be the deciding factor in selecting the best therapy for patients with ischemic heart disease. Besides viability, one should also look at other factors like target vessels, LV volumes, EF, etc. This is especially true if we use only SPECT or dobutamine echo for testing. And the most important thing is that whether they have viability or not, stitch-like patients do benefit from bypass surgery. And we should not be using viability studies alone, such as these specially, SPECT or dobutamine, to decide or to exclude patients from cardiac surgery. And I think we should wait for trials with other methods of viability detection like MRI. So I think I, think I end there and uh, before I end, a uh, message for Dr. Pelajani, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Kale and all my teachers for today from me and I'm sure from all my colleagues. A teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. Thank you very much.